Our next speaker is the C chief executive of Mindshower. Now, he's also the author of a geeky self-help book called Mind Hacking. You want to ask him a bit about that, perhaps? He, but he also is the public publisher of Bitcoin Market Journal. Today, he's going to be introducing a framework for token confidence, imp incredibly important topic. And so, actually, please, could I introduce you to the man who predicted crypto will never last? Please welcome John Hargrave to the stage. This is the most exciting time to be alive ever in human history, isn't it? Isn't it? I started out my career during the dot-com boom at a technology company called We published uh, computer magazines like PC Magazine, and uh, for the younger folks in the audience, magazines were these colored stacks of paper that were uh, sold in these things called bookstores. And uh, thank you, one person left. And uh, it was such an exciting time to be alive, that dot-com wave, working at a technology company during the technology revolution. But if anything, this time it's better. It's even more fun, it's more exciting, there's more innovation, there's more money, and it's moving so much faster than the earlier dot-com wave. It's the best time to be alive. So right now I publish a Bitcoin market journal, and uh, we basically want to make Bitcoin accessible to uh, everyday investors. So we're basically explaining the world of uh, Bitcoin, cryptocurrencies, and tokens in a way that's accessible and uh, everyone can understand. And my favorite story about Bitcoin is that very first transaction that was made using Bitcoin, the first real world transaction made by a fellow named Laszlo Hanwitz. You probably know the story. He paid another early Bitcoin adopter uh, thousands of Bitcoin to have two pizzas delivered to his home. And those pizzas today would be worth somewhere around $100 million. So there's two ways of looking at this story. The first is that he probably overpaid for the pizzas. He did get toppings, though. And the second is that he kick-started this entire $500 billion asset class because he showed that Bitcoin has real-world value. It actually can be used to purchase physical goods. And in that sense, I think he kind of got a deal. He's a hero, and that's why we should celebrate Laszlo, which we do on Bitcoin Pizza Day, which is May 22nd. But what drives crypto value. What drives the value in the first place? Maybe it not. How are we? Not any better. Yes, thank you. What drives crypto value in the first place? This is the question that obsesses me. So I recently co-authored a paper with uh, Olga from Smart Valor and the Harvard economist Navrup Sedev. And we basically looked at how do we value tokens? How do we place a value? And we came up with a framework or a model uh, for valuing tokens, the framework for token confidence that you can use to value cryptocurrencies or these new token offerings. And we need it, right? Because if you haven't heard, there's a tidal wave of tokens coming our way. Everything in the world is going to be tokenized. And like the stock market, that means everyday investors are going to be able to buy fractional shares. We're going to be able to buy a slice of just about anything from uh, real estate to fine art to companies. And this unlocks massive value. What the stock market did for us was it allowed everyday investors to enter the market by diversifying risk and letting us all buy a small part. That created a wave of capital, and that's what's going to happen with tokens as well. And it's also going to create massive value because the holders of the underlying asset now have a heavy incentive to make sure that that asset has the highest perceived value that they can. So let's take, for example, a real estate investor in Dubai. Let's say he wants to invest in New York real estate, but he doesn't want to buy the whole skyscraper, so now it's tokenized and he can buy just 
a fraction, just a piece of that. Now it is in the best interest of the asset holder, the owner of that skyscraper, to continually increase the value of that skyscraper with capital improvements and better tenants and press releases. Let's say that you buy a token, a fractional share of a famous Andy Warhol painting. Now it's in the best interest of the owner of that painting to increase the public awareness and demand of Warhol's art. And let's say that VC firms who see their model being disrupted now decide to tokenize their companies. They're gonna to have to up their game. They're gonna to have to now show the value that they are bringing with every investment because they're gonna have thousands or even millions of investors buying tokens in their VC firms. So to figure out the value uh, of a known asset, it's fairly straightforward. We take the approximate asset value, we divide it by the number of tokens outstanding, and that gives us our token value. But what about assets of unknown value? And this is where most current crypto assets and cryptocurrencies stand. So are they overpriced? Are they underpriced? Who knows? It's all new territory. But a powerful clue can be found in network effects. So we all know about network effects where the number of users that are added to a network make the value of that network grow geometrically. Right, so classic example is telephones, two telephones, only one connection, five telephones, you get 10 connections, 12, you get 66 connections. So as the users grow, the value of the network grows geometrically. This is what's known as Metcalf's Law, my hero, rock star, Bob Metcalf, but what we found in our paper is Metcalf's Law also applies to crypto assets. This is significant. So here's the number of blockchain wallets over the last two years. Let's use that as an approximate uh, uh, guess on how many folks are in the crypto market. And here's the blockchain market capitalization. And you can see on the y-axis here that it is growing geometrically. So as the number of people come into this space, the value increases uh, by a factor of 10. So for every 10x users on a blockchain, the value of the network grows 100x. This is the slide. Take a picture and share it with your friends because for every 10x users on a blockchain, assuming that the token, uh, overall token supply stays fixed and constant, the value of the token grows 100x. This is a big deal. In plain English, what it means is the blockchain with the most users wins. Blockchains are about people. They're about people. We have to get people using these things. And when you have people using them, the value of the network increases geometrically, and so does the value of the token. That's what we found as a general rule of thumb. We call it Metcalf's Law of Crypto. We didn't get his permission on that. So what about new tokenized assets? How do we value ICOs and new token offerings? Well, at our uh, innovation hub in Boston, uh, we invite a lot of blockchain users uh, in monthly uh, blockchain investor meetups. Uh, our space is called Genesis Block. When you're in Boston, we welcome you to stop by. It's very exciting. It really is the hub of where everything's happening in blockchain. And we ask these investors in and give them ICOs, and we ask what do you think? And we listen to them, and we hear how they make decisions and what kinds of things they talked about. So we talk about, we talk with hundreds of crypto investors. And of course, how we all should value tokens is like a VC would value a company, right? We should be rigorous in looking at the team and the market and so forth. But how we actually value tokens is we're easily impressed with things like fancy brand names and important sounding titles and institutions and a good looking website and media buzz and people talking about it on Reddit and Telegram. And this is a problem. This is a problem. We need a tool to save us from ourselves. The great book, Thinking Fast and Slow by Daniel Kahneman won the Nobel Prize. And it basically talks about these investor biases, the way that we fool ourselves into thinking things are more valuable than they really are. So for example, we are herd animals. 
We cannot help ourselves. It's how we're programmed. And it is very, very hard to follow, to not to follow everyone else, to think for ourselves. We trust what we know. This is hardwired into us for millions of years of evolution. And we fear what we don't. That makes it easy to be fooled by brands that we trust. So, for example, if we hear that the founder of Ethereum is going to start a new project, it's what's called the halo effect. We say, well, Ethereum was successful, so the new project will surely be. Not the case. Not the case. Now, when we look at experts, experts, and we look at their predictions over time, often these predictions are no better than chance. So, for example, if you go look at expert stock pickers, over the long haul, in aggregate, stock pickers are no better than a monkey throwing darts at a board. Algorithms are better. So for an algorithm, we look for three to five criteria that really matter. And then we ask three to five questions to get at each of those criteria. And we feed it into an algorithm. Best of all is an algorithm plus an expert on top of that. Uh, this kind of idea of humans and machines working together is the future. This is the future of the human race, folks. It's te techno sapiens. That's what we're all evolving into. And that's how we created the framework for token confidence. And the idea behind this is it's a framework or a model or a tool that you can use to help you rigorously analyze and evaluate these token offerings. There's five categories in it, and each of these have three three to six subcategories, and you ask the questions and rate the new project or new token offering from one, the worst, to five, the best. You average those subcategories, and then you average the categories uh, in total. Now, I'll go through the categories briefly for you. So the first is the market. So we look for projects with a clearly defined market and a clearly defined customer. And we look for markets that are large and growing. The second is competitive advantage. We want to know, does the project have a moat? Do they have some kind of technical or legal or competitive advantage, maybe a patent that's going to protect them from other competitors entering the space? The third is we look for a rock star management team, like this, my favorite painting of all time. We want to know, do they have a demonstrated track record of entrepreneurial success? Super important. The token mechanics, we want to know how are they setting up the rules of this economy. A lot of people dig deep into the technical, the actual code. We think that's a mistake. People fall down the rabbit hole of code. But code can be changed but the underlying token mechanics cannot easily be changed. So figure out how are the rules of the game being set up from the beginning, and are they fair? Do they make sense for the long term? And finally, user adoption. The blockchain is about people. Hashtag that. Send it out. Because people have to use these things in order for them to be valuable. So how are they going to get people to use these projects? Do they have a path for that, a credible strategy? So today, just like Oprah, everybody here gets a valuation framework. Uh, it's on your seats. And if you don't have one, too bad. I'm sorry, we ran out of them, but uh, you can ask someone else here. And uh, some lucky folks also got one of our ICO manifestos. These go so fast. One side is for founders, the other side is for investors. We give this out free of charge, and it talks through some of our philosophy for investing uh, in these. And briefly, that is, we look for great projects with great managers, just like every great investor, uh, Warren Buffett, Charlie Munger, Ben Graham. We look for projects with lots of users. We want lots of people on these blockchains so that we can enjoy the network effects and see that token rise in value. We rigorously analyze each project. The advantage of this model, which we hope will be an industry standard, is that you can compare apples to apples across various projects. Look for people to challenge your beliefs. The tightrope that we are always walking is between being overly confident so that we're not able to process new information and not being confident enough so that we experience FUD and FOMO. 
that's the, the fine balance that we're always trying to walk. And finally, we're looking for projects that add long-term value. This is the spirit of this space that we're working in right now, adding value. How much value is being added today by Olga and Smart Valor through this whole conference, through the conversations that are going on? How much value is being added from this framework that we're giving you right now? A hundred million dollars, a billion dollars, a trillion? I don't know, but it's very exciting to think about the value that's being created. That's the spirit of what we're trying to do. And I hope I added a little bit of value to your day today. I'm John Hargrave, and thank you. Thank you very much, John. Much appreciated. I'm going to ask you just to wait there for one minute, if I may. We may have time just for one super question from the audience. By the way, thank you for the wonderful post-lunch energy. We really did appreciate it. That was, that was awesome. Um, who has a question for John? Uh, I like the uh, billion, dollar, billion dollar value added by the uh, pricing matrix. So anybody has a question about that? When I pass the microphone, sorry, would you mind passing the microphone back? And no, I'm going to come around here um, and say who you are and then your question, please. Hi, my name's Jennifer Wu. I'm the CFO of ScanTrust. Just a, um, a quick question. Thank you for sharing your framework mm -hmm. for sure. token confidence. It sounds really great. Um, but of all the ICOs that you've seen out there, how many ICOs do you really see that fit your framework? Uh, well, they all fit the framework in that they can be evaluated using that framework. And that's the idea that we have an apples to apples model that we can use to compare all these projects. And again, we want this to be the industry standard. Our team of journalists and analysts at Bitcoin Market Journal have analyzed about a thousand ICOs to date and crypto projects. And we use this model uh, and very much like this, we uh, bring it out there and uh, uh, share this with folks, and we sort of get an average on all of their opinion, and that becomes our, our rating. We also uh, are doing this now with investors worldwide. I was in San Francisco on Monday, and we break uh, our workshops up into teams, and then we train them to uh, invest these as well. These are ordinary, uh, you might call them individual crypto investors, and we walk them through the model and then take their ratings as well. And they usually match up pretty closely with, with our expert opinions. So One more question, question, just over here, please. Hi, I'm Jane. Hi, Jane. Um, hi. Just wanted to ask a very quick question. All this analysis that you're doing of the ICOs, do you make this public? Yes. So this the question is, the is, do we make it public? Yes. It's on BitcoinMarketJournal.com. We uh, analyze, rate, and review, first of all, what we call a quick score, which is sort of an initial pass, but then our analysts go in and do a deeper dive using this framework. Yep. Thank you very much. Please put your hands together for John Hargrave. Thank you, sir.